the verse that we know so well, verse 13 to 15 from the Apostle Paul. He speaks about reaching forward, pressing toward the mark. He forgets the things that are behind. One of my favorite quotes goes like this. If you can't fly, then learn to run. If you can't run, then learn to walk. And if you can't walk, then learn to crawl. But whatever you do, keep moving forward. Lot was told to move forward. Get out of this place. It might even be a crawl for us at times. But you have to start, and you have to move forward. And we see Lot and his family being instructed to do just that, to flee to the mountains, pressing forward so that they might escape the coming judgment. Now, young people, where was Abraham in comparison to Lot? Lot's told to get to the mountains. The mountains to the west would lead Lot and his family to Hebron, to Mamre, to the encampment of Abraham. And of course we know from our studies in Genesis 13 how Abram went back to the mountain when he suffered a trial in his life. When he was brought out of it, he too went to a mountain. Between Bethel and Ai, Abram goes back to the same place to commit himself back to God, to get a fresh start, to recognize what he had done and to correct it in his life moving forward. And here in Genesis 19, we have the instruction to Lot, get to the mountain. To go up a mountain, young people, to go up a mountain, it means that you have to go on a bit of a journey. And for Lot here, the instruction to go up a mountain was, Lot, get a fresh start. Do what Abraham did and go back to where it started. From a place where he had first made a decision. To go back to where he could see all that was before him. In Genesis 13, Lot lifted up his eyes. He saw the well-watered plains of Jordan. No doubt from that vantage point, he could see all that was now down below him, about to be destroyed. Lot, it's time for a fresh start. His initial decision in Genesis 13 it has proven to be foolish. It's proven to be devastating for his family. Would he ascend the mountain now and decide differently? There's a great lesson to be learned from this, isn't there? from ascending a mountain to make a decision. In the New Testament, our Lord Jesus Christ regularly taught on mountains. Did you notice that from Matthew 5 at our reading tonight? The very first verse, Christ took them up into a mountain. Consistently, Christ taught from a vantage point, from a mountaintop. Why? Jesus required men and women, those that would hear his message, to make an effort to hear it. It's not an easy thing. I require effort, Jesus was saying. They needed to make an effort to ascend towards God. Let's just turn over in our Bibles to Psalm 24. Let's just see how this idea then is brought out for us. Genesis 19 has Lot being told to get to a mountain. What about you and I? Psalm 24, beginning in verse 3. Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord? Or who will stand in his holy place? He that hath clean hands and a pure heart, who hath not lifted up his soul unto vanity nor sworn deceitfully, he shall receive the blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. That's the question for us. We're being instructed to do the same. Who will ascend the mountain? Are we prepared to put in the effort to go up that mountain and to learn what God would have us to do to be more like his son? It's an exhortation for us when we read that Lot was instructed to get to a mountaintop. 
Will we do the same? Will we purify our hearts? Will we exhibit the qualities that we're being asked to here in Psalm 24 to receive that blessing from God? This was an opportunity in Lot's life to rededicate himself, to assess what was before him. But the verses show that Lot had a different idea entirely. Let's just come back to Genesis 19 and pick up in verse 18. When he was instructed to escape to the mountain, this is what Lot said. Verse 18, And Lot said unto them, O, oh, not so, my lord. Behold, now thy servant hath found grace in thy sight, and thou hast magnified thy mercy, which thou hast shown unto me in saving my life. And I cannot escape to the mountain, lest some evil take me, and I die. Behold, now this city is near, to flee unto, and it is a little one. O, oh, let me escape thither. Is it not a little one? and my soul shall live. Here was God providing means for preserving Lot and his family, and yet Lot is reluctant to take the journey into the mountain. And in verse 20, it seems as though Lot correlates the size of the city that he wanted to flee to, to the morality of that city. His thinking was that since this city is small, Perhaps it can't be that evil, or it just won't be included in the judgment from God. He wasn't told yet what cities were going to be included. But he makes the presumption himself. His thinking was that since this city is small, perhaps it won't be included. Let me escape thither, he says. And yet his eyes were veiled once again to God's will and God's plan. Lot presumed the mercy of God in sparing a city, even a small one at that. And in these verses from verse 18 to 20, we see Lot questioning the clear instruction from the angels and the requests that they had given. And so he puts forward an alternate option that he determines. Again, we see a similar problem come up with Lot. Because it was back in Genesis 13 that he lifted up his eyes. He assesses things by his eyes. And here in Genesis 19, his determining factor is what? It's the size of the city. It's what he could see. But the angels patiently oblige. Just look at what they say in verse 21. He said unto him, See, I have accepted thee concerning this thing also, that I will not overthrow this city, for the which thou hast spoken. Haste thee, escape thither, for I cannot do anything till thou become thither. Therefore the name of the city was called Zor. And just like last night, again we are shown the patience and the goodness of God. But perhaps we have a question in our minds. Why would he allow this compromise? Perhaps it was due to the exertion and the tiredness that Lot was feeling at this stage. Or well, perhaps it was because Lot was about to witness a very stern warning against compromise. Regardless of the reason, God answers Lot's request that he has. And from verse 22, we note that the preservation of the faithful, that being Lot and his family, the preservation of the faithful takes precedence to the destruction of wickedness. But it's not a substitute for it. We'll just repeat that. <laughs> That's a critical principle that comes out in this section. The preservation of the faithful takes precedence to the destruction of wickedness, but it's not a substitute for it. And as this new day is dawning in verse 23, Lot and his family enter into this city, into Zor. It's a new day, it's a new era where judgment will reign. And Lot is safely in Zor by the mercy and goodness of God when the judgment takes place. Then the Lord rained upon Sodom, verse 24 says, and upon Gomorrah brimstone and fire from the Lord out of heaven. And he overthrew those cities and all the plain and all the inhabitants of the cities and that which grew upon the ground. All the plain. All of the cities. 
all the inhabitants, all that grew on the ground. Sodom, Gomorrah, Adma, and Zeboam destroyed. Young people, it was all that Lot had fallen for in Genesis 13. All of that plain that he lifted up his eyes and saw, all of it is gone. This was what Lot had chosen. And in one day, in an action by God, gone. For his pursuit of these things, Lot ended up losing everything. What was once so attractive to him, the very reason that Lot had left Abraham, no longer there, it's gone. We have to stop and consider the point that's being driven home. Because it's going to be the same for each of us when Christ returns. All of the present attractions that this world can offer to us, all of it will be gone. We know that where our treasure is, there will our heart be also. And our instruction is to lay up treasure in heaven where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt. We know that this will happen. And so the question is, where is our treasure? Well, we didn't, we wish we didn't have to read the next verse in Genesis 19. Because the next verse is the bookend to this episode in Sodom. And it represents yet another family tragedy for Lot. But his wife looked back from behind him, and she became a pillar of salt. From the very first word in verse 26, we recognize that there clearly should have been another outcome. This was not what God wanted. He is not willing that any should perish. But, Lot's wife looked back. The word looked, it means to scan, to look intently. It implies that you're looking with pleasure, favor, or care. Young's literal translates this as looked, looketh expectantly. We get the idea, don't we? In 2 Corinthians 4, there's a verse that's great to have in our margins, beside verse 26. Let's just turn there together. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. <coughs> 2 Corinthians 4, verse 18. Another well-known verse. It says, while we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. This is a verse, this is a principle that Lot's wife did not understand. She gave careful contemplation to Sodom, and that was her end. Now, let's, while we're in the New Testament, let's just turn back to Luke chapter 17. Perhaps the thought is, well, maybe she was just looking back because there was family members that were left behind. Let's not be so hard on Lot's wife. This was a mother's care for her children. She was looking back in sadness. Luke 17 clears that up for us. Beginning in verse 31, it says, In that day, he which shall be upon the housetop and his stuff in the house, let him not come down to take it away. And he that is in the field, let him likewise not return back. Remember, Lot's wife. Whosoever shall seek to save his life shall lose it. And whosoever shall lose his life shall preserve it. 
This was a woman whose primary concern was for the life she was leaving behind. It was the way of life that she was told to walk away from, and she couldn't do it. That's the context of Luke 17, 32. It's not people. It's stuff in the house. It's materialism. This wasn't a mother's care for her children. This was her love for the things that she was leaving behind. Verse 34 of Luke 17 continues. I tell you, in that night there shall be two in one bed. The one shall be taken, and the other shall be left. Two shall be grinding together, the one shall be taken, and the other left. Two shall be in the field, the one shall be taken, and the other left. And they answered and said unto him, Where, Lord? And he said unto them, Wheresoever the body is, thither will the eagles be gathered together. What's the point? What was their question? Where, Lord? Where would they be left? The one who is not taken, where will they be left? Remember, Lot's wife. Young people, the other will be left in the place that they prefer. Where they want to be is where they will be. That's where they will be when they're left behind. That's what's happened to Lot's wife in Genesis 19. She gave careful contemplation to Sodom. She looked intently. She looked with pleasure. And she was left in the place that she preferred. That's the exhortation for us in three simple words. Remember Lot's wife. In farming, there's a strategy called choosing a strike point. And what it means is that when you're out in the fields and you're plowing, to ensure that you're going in a straight line, you choose a strike point. You choose an object in the distance that you aim towards to keep you moving forward. And if you look back, if you lose that strike point, and you look back to admire perhaps what you've planted behind you, you start to veer off course. Lot's wife missed her strike point. She was supposed to look forward, to forget everything behind. She had no strike point. She was tempted to glance back, choosing the pleasures of sin for a season, instead of a life dedicated to her Heavenly Father. As we come back to Genesis 19 in our Bibles, we notice the other phrase that's used of Lot's wife in the verse that we've read. It said that she looked back from behind him. Young people, Lot's wife was falling behind. She was lagging behind the group. It was indicative of her true thought towards what they were doing. It hints that perhaps Lot was not aware of her true desires to stay in the city. I often think of hiking with children when I read that phrase. That she looked back from behind him, how she lagged behind the group. When you go hiking with children, they are usually good for the first hundred feet. And then they get bored and they start looking down at their feet and they start dragging their heels and they quickly lag behind. And if you don't look back to find them, Oftentimes, they're left behind somewhere, off in a, a bush, trying to chase a rock in a stream or something like that. But this is what we know from Lot's wife. She may have been out of Sodom, but her heart was not. And we know from Romans 1 and verse 24 that what you desire most, God will give you. And here was Lot's wife, her desire clearly laid out before God. And it's before you and I to contemplate, to think about, and to learn from as we've read it tonight. And in this action, turning around just to gaze for just a moment at the city they were told to leave, she becomes a pillar of salt. The word for salt, it actually means a powder. 
as easily pulverized and dissolved. And we think of the words of Daniel 2 and verse 34, where we read of the stone that was cut without hands that strikes the image and breaks it into pieces. And that word for break in Daniel 2, it means to crush or to beat into a powder. Well, what connects these two references? What connects Daniel 2 with Genesis 19? It's God not just destroying a place. It's God destroying a mindset, a way of thinking, city dwellers. Here was Lot's wife representing this mentality, this way of thinking, this way of life in opposition to God. Salt we know, it's a preservative. And God preserves her error forever for Lot's family to remember them. It's an experience to remember and never forget. You know, the wonderful thing about the Bible is that there's not a single picture in it. It's not a picture Bible that we have before us. And yet we know that the Bible is full of pictures. You can just close your eyes and think of David and Goliath, of Deborah and Barak. The Bible is not a picture book, but it's full of pictures for us. And verse 26 of Genesis 19 lays out an amazing picture that needs to be vivid in our minds as we remember Lot's wife tonight. I just want to read a quote. It was Brother H.P. Mansfield who gave his picture for this specific verse. Just think about it in your own minds. The early morning sun was shining, bathing the city of Sodom in a golden light. The plain looked peaceful and pleasant under its warm caress. Perhaps from some eminence, Lot's wife looked down on the city she loved so much and regretted the need to flee. She was not prepared to accept the discipline and the separation that was required by the truth. Though she believed the angels, she had no love for their message, no real revulsion against the way of life she had witnessed in Sodom. Perhaps she doubted the urgency and the necessity of flight. If so, she's a warning to us all. The solemn warning, remember Lot's wife, is very much to the point in our materialistic age, with its emphasis on pleasure and permissiveness. And here's the key. The more a person becomes involved in such matters, the more attractive the world becomes, and the greater its influence upon us. And so we're going to leave this verse with a simple question. What activities are we involved in that may make the world more attractive to us? In our lives, what has the greatest influence on us? Are we watchers of the world, or are we followers of the Word? Well, we stated last night how Genesis 19 is a chapter that offers many contrasts to us. And we looked at the contrasting lives of Lot and Abraham that were presented to us in Genesis 18 and then Genesis 19. Well, let's consider the contrasting wives, Sarah and Lot's wife. What we notice is that it was two very different lives that they lived. We see from the very beginning that Sarah was content with the living situation that they were in, to be strangers and pilgrims. Whereas from Luke 17, as we just saw, Lot's wife struggled with the materialistic view. We know from Genesis 18, when the angels come to visit, Sarah helps to prepare a meal. She helped Abraham in the labors that were required. Genesis 19 oddly leaves out Lot's wife in the preparation of unleavened bread. We know from Genesis 20 that she faithfully followed Abraham. That was Sarah. Lot's wife reluctantly left Sodom. Sarah called Abraham Lord. Lot's wife turned back from behind Lot. 
Sarah trusted in God, we're told specifically in 1 Peter 3. Whereas in Genesis 19.26, Lot's wife put her trust in uncertain riches. In Genesis 12 and Genesis 20, Sarah's prayers were heard by God. And yet in Genesis 19 and 26, once again, we don't see any mention of any prayers. And then in Isaiah 51, Sarah is likened to the well from whence we are digged. She is fruitful. She provides health. And yet Lot's wife becomes a pillar of salt. Solitary. It's an unfruitful end. It's a complete contrast that we see. We are to remember Lot's wife in an effort to not repeat her mistakes. Here are two women, two wives, who stand in complete contrast to one another. Well, let's come back to Genesis 19 and pick up in verse 27. It says, And Abraham got up early in the morning to the place where he stood before the Lord. And he looked toward Sodom and Gomorrah, and toward all the land of the plain, and behold, and lo, the smoke of the country went up as the smoke of a furnace. And it came to pass, when God destroyed the cities of the plain, that God remembered Abraham, and sent Lot out of the midst of the overthrow, when he overthrew the cities in the which Lot dwells. Abraham now awakes to see what would become of Lot. He looks toward Sodom in stark contrast to the look toward Sodom that Lot's wife had. Abraham looks for an entirely different reason, and we know how it said Abraham got up early in the morning. He had genuine concern. We know this to be very typical of Abraham's character. Abraham was not one to ever delay. It was a common characteristic of him. He was always doing the work of God. He showed care and concern for God's family. Just think about Abraham. Think of how sad this morning would have been to look towards Sodom and to have God's answer for his request to spare the city if there was but ten righteous. And here it is. Here's the answer. The smoke of a furnace billowing from Sodom and Gomorrah. We think of the sadness that he must have felt. He would have known that this meant members of Lot's own family had succumbed to the city itself. In verse 28, the Hebrew for furnace, the smoke of a furnace, it's used of a smelting furnace. It's a process of refinement. Our minds go to so many different places when we think of refinement in the Bible. It's used in so many areas. 1 Corinthians 3, verse 11 to 15 is one of them. It says, For no one can lay any foundation other than that which is being laid, which is Jesus Christ. If anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, or straw. Each builder's work will be clearly seen. For the day will make it clear, because it will be revealed with fire. And the fire will test what kind of work each has done. If what someone has built survives, he will receive a reward. If someone's work is burnt up, he will suffer loss. This area of Sodom and Gomorrah, the cities in the plain were consumed in that refining fire, nothing was left. And we have it on the screen, the definitions of all of those places. It's a self-fulfilling prophecy. We see in this destruction the prominence and the beauty of the earthly has now become a scorched heap. God's using the names of these cities against themselves. <coughs> And yet we read in verse 29 that amidst God's judgment on these cities, God remembered Abraham. It's the same language that was used in Genesis 8 and verse 1 when God remembered Noah. For so long he was in that ark alone with just his family. 
a boat just floating on the water. Silence. But God remembered Noah. And God remembered Abraham. Young people, God always remembers. For some it might be days, like it was for Noah. For some it might be years, like it was for Abraham and Sarah. Twenty-five years between a promise and a son. It might be days or weeks or months for us. God never forgets us. And just note the emphasis at the end of verse 29, that God overthrew the cities in the which Lot dwelt. The emphasis on the fact that Lot dwelt in these cities. And so the point that's being driven home is that while God can help us when we make mistakes and bad choices, we live with the consequences of the choices that we make in our lives. And of course, Lot cried against the sin of Sodom. But he chose to dwell in those same cities. And so Lot is now saved by his relationship with Abraham, the friend of God. Without Abraham pleading for God not to destroy the righteous with the wicked, this story may have ended very differently. And yet we see once again the goodness of our God, the mercy that he shows to Lot and to his family. <coughs> Young people, verse 30 to 38 of Genesis 19 are the final record we have of Lot in the Old Testament. Outside of the two references in the New Testament, in Luke 17 and 2 Peter 2, this is the final story that we have of Lot's life. Lot went up out of Zor and dwelt in the mountain and his two daughters with him. For he feared to dwell in Zor, and he dwelt in a cave, he and his two daughters. And the firstborn said unto the younger, Our father is old, and there is not a man in the earth to come in unto us after the manner of all the earth. Come, let us make our father drink wine, and we will lie with him, that we may preserve seed of our father. And they made their father drink wine that night, and the firstborn went in and lay with her, her father, and he perceived not when she lay down or when she arose. And it came to pass on the morrow that the firstborn said unto the younger, Behold, I lay yesterday with my father. Let us make him drink wine this night also, and go that way. Lie with him, that we may preserve seed of our father. And they made their father drink wine that night also. And the younger arose and lay with him, and he perceived not when she lay down or when she arose. Thus were both the daughters of Lot with child by their father. And the firstborn bare a son, and called his name Moab, the same as the father of the Moabites unto this day. And the younger she also bare a son, and called his name ben Ammon, the same as the father of the children of Ammon unto this day. A brother described this last picture that we have of Lot as a man who is destitute and in despair, overcome with grief at his loss, in a drunken stupor, having no control over his body and having no, no control over his family. Here he is, in the mountains, that he had previously tried to avoid. And we read how Lot dwelt in the mountain. Lot is consistently dwelling in places that he shouldn't. Another opportunity to get up and go back to Abraham. He's fearful to live in Zor, so head west. And yet he decides to dwell in a cave, away from any positive influence, and the results are disastrous. Perhaps, thought, perhaps Lot thought that he'd been rescued by Abraham before, only to again return to Sodom. And now with the city destroyed, all of his possessions gone, his family reduced just to two daughters, perhaps he found it difficult to admit his mistakes and to go back to Abraham. It's similar, isn't it, to the parable of the prodigal son, who recognized that if he was to go back to his father, he had to be willing and prepared to take on a lesser role as a servant he puts forward swallowing his pride to go back to his father's house. Perhaps Lot just couldn't do that. 
The final words of verse 30 impressed upon us just how sharp this decline of Lot was. The temporary prosperity of the world is gone, and now we have Lot in a cave with his two daughters. And the events that follow are unfortunate and not pleasant to read, given the actions that take place. But it reveals to us the influence that the world can have on us. It highlights the very fact that we exhibit the common behavior that we witness or that we're exposed to. Because we have to ask the question in verse 31 as to where the daughters would have learned this type of behavior. Why would this have seemed appropriate to them? Why would this even have seemed as a possible solution? Perhaps it's the influence of Sodom. Perhaps this was common in Sodom, a city where little thought was given to such wickedness. <coughs> Verse 31 in Young's literal translation, it says, As a man there is not in the earth to come in unto us, as is the way of all the earth, as is common. The way it happened in the world around them, as they witnessed and were exposed to. And what did they mean that there was not another man? They were just in Zor, in a city, probably full of men. Well, perhaps it was their feeling that the actions, that they had separated themselves from everyone else as a family, that no one would want them, they thought. And now it appears that they were prepared to perform an immoral behavior to meet that end. And we have a valuable lesson that comes out in verse 32 for us. It's not the first time that we've seen the effects of excess of wine and drunkenness in Genesis. Back in Genesis 9, we remember the story of Noah's nakedness and the events with Ham. We call to, to mind the words of Proverbs 20 and verse 1. Wine is a mocker, strong drink is raging, and whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. So how careful we need to be, as we've been clearly warned in Scripture of its effects in excess. And we know the disastrous results that these, these actions the daughters take had later on. How both the Moabites and the Ammonites bothered Abraham's descendants, a thorn in the flesh throughout history. And in Deuteronomy 23, these two nations are banned from Abraham's family. It's a sad end note to what's left of Lot's family. And it started with a single decision to take his family towards Sodom. And the picture we have of Lot portrayed in these verses is the last one we have of him in all of the Old Testament. He's drunk, he's helpless, he's fearful, and he's alone. With Abraham, Lot had been prosperous, he'd been honored, he'd been in the company with Abraham and with Sarah and their family. It's clearly shown the consequences of Lot's choices. Part of the image quality, but I, I love the picture that this gives for us. Because perhaps this is what it was like in Lot's mind. And perhaps it's not different in our own mind. Lot had a plan in Genesis 13. Perhaps he saw the well-watered plains and he thought life would be easier, less stressful than a wanderer's way of living. And his plan began to take shape. But God's plan may be drastically different than what we think. An easier life, young people, does not mean a better spiritual life. And we take comfort knowing that God will not give us more than we can bear. He will always provide a way of escape. But on that path, the decisions we make will have consequences if they're not in line with God. And we see that clearly in the life of Lot. So what are the exhortations for us from these verses in Genesis 19? Young people, we need to willingly cooperate with God as he works to deliver us from evil. It's interesting, isn't it? We can study a character like Lot. We can be in awe of the ability of God to save him from such a trial. But we ourselves won't turn to him when we're in trouble. God knows how to deliver the godly out of trial. 
And whatever we might think, our safety is in the company of our ecclesias, our CYCs, with other young people at youth conferences. It's around the study of the Word of God. We need to ask ourselves the question, are we watchers of the Word, or are we followers of the world? Lot's wife tried to secure the present that was before her, and she ended up losing the future. We alluded to Romans 1, verse 24, the principle that what we desire most, God will give us. So what is it that you desire? Be careful what you choose. For Lot's wife, she chose wrong. And she is set out as an example for eternity of what not to do. Of what it means to lose out on an opportunity for eternal life. What a disaster that would be. To know that a simple glance, a simple moment in our life, made us miss an opportunity at eternal life. We think of the instruction of Luke 17. Three simple words. Remember Lot's wife. Where will they be left? In the place they prefer. So young people, what's your preference? Do you really want to be here? Or is there somewhere else that you prefer? Do you really want to read the Word of God? Or is there something else that occupies your mind? Do you want the kingdom? Or is there somewhere else you'd rather be? And lastly, let's remember that we will exhibit the common behavior that we witness and that we are exposed to. We need to be careful as to what we are exposed to. Whatever the decision, we may have to suffer the consequences when it comes to this, there's a quote that highlights just how tough on ourselves we need to be in our lives now. Be kindly and forbearing to everybody but yourself. Be merciless with yourself. Judge yourself by the highest standard. Allow no excuse for your own deficiency. Ever afflict your soul and press higher. There are many lessons to take away from Genesis 19. We need to learn from Lot. We need to remember Lot's wife. And of course, we need to pray for the grace of our God to lead us to salvation in the day of judgment soon to come on this earth. But we can't end here, can we? We can't leave Lot just yet. Because in 2 Peter 2 and verse 7, we know that Lot is called righteous. He's called just. And while we've certainly been able to learn from the decisions and the consequences in his life, we're going to see the positive aspects of his character. And God willing, we're going to consider those aspects Friday night. We're going to see how important this story and these characters are for us to consider. Because it's directly related to our life now, as you wait for our Lord's return. Because as it was in the days of Lot, even thus shall it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed.